with money flowing into private credit, just an exuberant market, more investors are now asking, where is the most risk? Sachin Kajuria spent years at private credit giant Apollo before forming his own firm, Achilles Management, and he has some views on where the market. He joins us now. And when you have this much money coming in, it really does raise the question, is there too much money coming in? So I think the private credit party will continue right until the music stops. But small cracks are starting to show. If you look at the pickup in default rates on the public side, high yield leverage loans, I think they're likely to be higher on the private side. Remember that a lot of companies with risky credit ratings have kind of migrated from uh, the public markets into the private markets. And so I think those cracks are starting to show. You're seeing emerging dispersion. Uh, it's not quick. It's not going to break tomorrow. But I think if you're paying attention, it's hiding in plain sight. So what is exactly hiding in plain sight? Where is the most risk that investors probably are not paying attention to these days? So the interesting thing is the more you talk to people who are underwriting these uh, credits and monitoring them, you know, the more they say, well, underwriting standards have weakened. We can see everybody else to a certain extent with lax underwriting but standards. But not myself. But not me. Um, <laughs> you know, so, you know we're, we're sort of solid. Um, but if you look at, in leveraged loans, the, pre the dominance of Covlight, if you look at um, the spreads, you know, massive competition coming in, uh, banks are back, leverage loan markets are back. And so with a supply demand imbalance in credit, with many more people looking to put money to work because they're uh, okay with high, relatively high all-in yields, despite the fact that most of it is rates, um, you know, you're finding that I think you're generally seeing bubbles in a number of places emerging. You know, they're not big bubbles, they're not sort of fissures, but you're seeing these bubbles emerge and it's the inevitable consequence of so much money coming in and you know, people needing to compete, essentially like auctions, to, uh, to get that business done and to make the sale. Is that a short way of saying that there is too much money chasing too few deals right now? Yes, and so you know, if you look at uh, the spread compression, it's pretty amazing. And you know, you, I talk to people who are selling these funds or you know, pitching them to me and they say, well, uh, look at the all-in yield. I said, well, most of that is rates. If 75, 80% of the yield you're giving me is basically rates, um, you know, that extra risk I'm taking on top, perhaps less so in the senior, but particularly in the junior end of the capital structure, is that worth it? Is that really an excess return that is commensurate with that additional risk? And I think it's important to put a spotlight on this now ahead of when we could see more general problems, especially if we are in a you know elevated rate environment which appears to be I think more likely the case going forward well to that end also you said small cracks forming when do those small cracks become bigger cracks I think it depends on two things so one the economy is still incredibly resilient so you know you have the break which is the monetary transmission mechanism it's more or less working inflation is slowly coming down maybe we see bumpy prints along the road but it's working you also have the gas in the economy. There's been a lot of fiscal stimulus, a lot of deficit spending. There's still a huge amount of liquidity in the economy. If the economy, of course, changes, if the consumers start spending less because they have a long period of time where they're paying more interest expense and debt servicing expense, you know, then I think you could see those cracks exacerbate. And then number two, you know, the elevated rate environment, I think no one has a crystal ball, but if you look at treasury issuance, you look at uh, fiscal stimulus, you look at deficit, uh, uh, you know, still high, these are likely to keep rates elevated. And what that will do is the longer you have this time, the greater the pressure cooker on capital structures. And then I think you'll see these cracks, you know, getting bigger, basically. So if you think there are cracks forming, it really does raise a question as well of who you like at this point. You used to work at Apollo. Would you invest in a new, a new private credit fund offered by Apollo today? So look, I think the folks who have distress expertise, Apollo, Aries, I mean, there are many. Um, you know, they're gonna be looking at this with uh, you know, a good lens. And so I think that when the dust settles on this vintage, um, you know, those kinds of people are probably more likely to, to do well. And I think what I find most interesting is possibly not buying a diverse forward portfolio now, but actually waiting a bit because of the wall of maturities coming up. So you have wave of wave of maturities coming up in the next five years. And so if you overlay on that wave of maturities where you're seeing defaults pick up and you're looking at individual companies and individual sectors, I think you'll find a lot of better opportunities going forward than you see today with less compressed spreads, with more alpha, 
and more excess return per unit of risk. Um, you know, that's, that's where I think is the most exciting place to be, is to really look at those maturities going forward in funds like these folks manage and other places. You know, it's interesting because you kind of mentioned here the broadly syndicated market. You have the flexibility from where you sit today yes. to invest in anything, honestly. Yes. Right? So if you are choosing between private credit and broadly syndicated loan markets right now, where do you put your money? So it's, it's lo honestly, it's loan by loan. I mean, I think if you see a piece of paper, I have so many things pitched to me, and you see something that has been so heavily competed, almost like an equity shootout would be in a private equity auction, and you think, even if I like the name, you know, that spread is just too thin, right? I'm not really looking at the all-in yield. I'm looking at how much alpha am I getting on that individual name. Um, I still think the, the people who are doing private credit are doing a really interesting job of originating. So I think there are plenty of pockets there. But I, I really think that we should, you know, ahead of when there are serious issues, if there are serious issues, people should be really thinking about the maturity walls coming up. And for that, I think private credit is probably in a better place to be if you're selective. So when does that better place come? You were saying kind of wait for that maturity wall yep. to come to the fruition. I mean, that is code word for they're going to refinance at higher rates, these companies. Yes. Well, they, I mean, if, if rates stay elevated, then they will be refinancing at more attractive terms to the investor than, you know, let's say they might be able to today. Um, I think the wave starts relatively small in the next year or two. Uh, tens of billions rather than hundreds of billions. But, you know, it picks up very strongly in the next four or five years. And if you can wait, if you don't have to put all your money to work today, then I think that's a smarter place to be, uh, you know, than putting it into a diversified portfolio. Remember, it's not venture capital, right? It's not like it's okay if some loans work out and other loans don't work out. The band of outcomes for credit is more or less well-defined. And so because you have capped upside, I think it's better to be selective and look for these opportunities in the next five years. Credit investors, it's the money you don't lose rather than right. the money you make sometimes.